All right, we'll talk about Graham's law of effusion. And before we talk about Graham's law of effusion, we've got to understand what is effusion. So what is effusion? So let's say I got a balloon, and in this balloon is oxygen gas and hydrogen gas. So let's say I just took a needle and I stabbed the balloon. What's going to happen? So true, but what's it going to look like when I stab that balloon? Anybody ever stabbed a balloon before? It's going to pop. It's going to pop. But let's say instead I took a piece of scotch tape and put it on the balloon. And then I very gently pressed the needle right through the scotch tape. It doesn't pop. The scotch tape holds the balloon together in the area where you pierced it. And so it just pokes a hole. You pull the needle back out and you got a hole. And because you have a hole, now the gases will start escaping. Effusion is the process of a gas passing through a narrow slit. It doesn't have to be out of a balloon. It could just be going from, you know, on one side of a wall to the other side of a wall or something like that. But when a gas passes through a narrow slit, that's called effusion. Cool. Graham's law of effusion allows us to compare two gases escaping through that narrow slit, which one escapes faster and how much faster it escapes. So anybody remember the general principle? Which one of these gases will escape faster? Hydrogen. Hydrogen definitely escapes faster. Why? Because it's lighter. Because it's lighter, what's true? Faster. It moves faster on average. And if it moves faster on average, then it's going to escape faster on average. So let's see where this comes from. So the one thing about kinetic molecular theory we didn't talk about at the end, but that I'll bring up now, is that it turns out that the kinetic energy of a gas, the average kinetic energy of the molecules of a gas, is proportional to temperature. There's an equation for it. Don't worry about it. And so here's the deal. If two gases, and this doesn't matter what the gas is, it's proportional to temperature. So if you have two gases in the same balloon, well, if they're in the same balloon, then you can assume they have the same overall temperature. And if they have the same overall temperature, then they have the same kinetic energy. And so if we look at this, what's the formula for kinetic energy? Anybody know from physics? One half mv squared, maybe? So if you look then, what this would mean in this case is 1 half mO2vO2 squared equals 1 half mH2vH2 squared. And technically, if this is average kinetic energy, notice not all molecules move the same speed. Some are faster, some are slower. And we can use their overall average velocity to come out with an average kinetic energy. And so the velocities here are averages so of all the molecules in that sample of gas. Well, I can cancel out the one halves right off the bat. So, and in this case, if we rearrange this a little bit, so I can get mass of O2 over mass of H2 equals velocity of H2 squared over velocity of O2 squared. And then if I take the square root of both sides, I get velocity of H2 over velocity of O2 is equal to the square root of the mass of O2 over the mass of H2. And this is kind of where Graham's law of effusion is derived from. It turns out the rate of effusion is proportional to the velocity. And so Graham's law of effusion takes this one step further and says that the rate of effusion for H2 divided by the rate of effusion for O2 is equal to the square root of the molar mass of O2 over the molar mass of H2. And so notice it's rate of one gas over rate of a second gas, but it's molar mass of the second gas over the molar mass of the first gas. This would be the relevant equation we're going to use to compare the rates of effusion. And usually the calculation you're going to do doesn't actually calculate either rate independently. It usually just calculates this as a ratio. And so in this case, that's my question. If you start out with equal amounts, equal number of moles of O2 and H2 in this balloon, the question is, which one escapes faster? Thomas already told us it's the lighter one. So, and how much faster? 
Cool. So we're just going to plug and chug here. So if we look here, rate of hydrogen over oxygen will equal the square root. What's the molar mass of O2? It's not 16. It's O2, 32. And the molar mass of H2, 2. What's 32 divided by 2? 16. What's the square root of 16? 4. And so what that means, notice if we look at this one more time, 4 is equal to the rate of hydrogen relative to the rate of oxygen's effusion. So it tells us that hydrogen's escaping faster, and on average it's escaping four times faster. Now again, this is tricky. So and I want to just run this point home. Which gas had the greater kinetic energy? Notice kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And here's where things get confusing. Because they both had the same temperature, what was true again? They had the same kinetic energy. So their kinetic energies are exactly the same. No difference there. But even though kinetic energy is the energy of motion, they have the same kinetic energy, but do not have the same average velocity. So the average velocities are indeed different. And the lighter gas has a higher average velocity because they have the same kinetic energy. Think about it this way. If you took a Volkswagen engine and put it in a Volkswagen, and then you took the same Volkswagen engine and put it in a semi, which Volkswagen engine has more power? The same engine, same power. And supplying the same power, they will supply the same energy to either vehicle. But giving the same amount of energy to a Volkswagen and the same amount of energy to a semi, which one's going to have a higher velocity? The Volkswagen. It's lighter. It'll go faster. Same energy. In this case, two gases at the same temperature, same kinetic energy. But the lighter one with the same energy will move faster. It'll have a higher velocity. Cool. Now, this is Graham's law of effusion. But you can also apply this to diffusion. If I were to take a bottle of cologne, and took this bottle of cologne and took the cap off and placed it over here on the piano in the corner and just left it there. Open. Pretty soon, everybody would what? Smell the cologne. So what is diffusion? Other way around. Some high to low. Good. The cologne is in high concentration right around the bottle. And it spreads out to areas of low concentration. That's diffusion, moving from high concentration to low concentration. So you can apply this the same way. So if you have hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, they'll diffuse dependent on, if they're at the same temperature anyways, which one's lighter. So let's pretend Thomas here knows that there's going to be this really cute girl that he likes at a party. And so Thomas goes out, and being the poor college student that he is, he buys some really cheap cologne. So, and his cheap cologne is based in ethanol. So the molecular weight of which is 2 carbons is 24, plus 16 is 40, plus 6 is 46. So, and he just drenches his collar in this lovely cheap cologne. First bad move. First bad move. It won't be the last one of your party here experience. But, so, and then Thomas goes to this party. And as soon as he walks in the door, he sees this girl across the room, and he gets nervous. And he just lets a little bit of flatulence go in his nervousness, the principal component of which is methane gas, the molecular weight of which is 16. And so my question for you is, across the room, the cute girl, which, what will she smell first, his cheap cologne? Or his flatulence? Yeah, she's going to smell his fart first. That's right. Sweet. Thanks for putting it plainly, Brie. So sweet. It's lighter and will therefore have a higher average velocity. Awesome. Thanks, Thomas. Not a good move. OK. So let's just get real for a minute. Terrible joke of the chapter. And talk about real gases. <clears throat> so ideal gases. Ideal gases don't have attractive forces between molecules. So which, by the way, another way to state that is you could say that all collisions are elastic. So if you're a physics buff, that might mean something. But same, saying all collisions between molecules are elastic is the same thing. It means the same thing, ultimately, that there are no attractive forces between the molecules. So and ideal gases, the molecules don't really take up any volume either. For real gases, though, real gases is now 
trying to approximate reality. We now know that those assumptions are never 100% correct. And for real gases, we're going to try to account for that. So, and this gets a lot more complex in a hurry, right? So the only equation you guys typically get are given for real gases is the van der Waals equation, the van der Waals equation. So in this case, you get P plus a n squared over v squared times v minus n b equals n r t. You don't have to memorize this equation. It'll be given to you on the front of your exam. And you probably, in all likelihood, won't even have to plug and chug with this thing. So they're probably not going to have you do a calculation with this either. So don't be prepared for like doing some ugly algebra equation or anything like that. It's probably not going to happen. What you do have to know is a couple of things about how this tries to better approximate reality than PV equals nRT. So if you look, so N still represents moles of gas and V is still volume, and you see all these things, but A and B are called the van der Waals constants, the van der Waals constants. So, and in this case, this term right here and this term right here, these are the corrections for the assumptions that were never true for an ideal gas. If you look, let's say I discovered the world's first truly ideal gas the world's first truly ideal gas, and I called it chadium, because I'm vain like that. So chadium, the world's first truly ideal gas. My question's for you. What would be the values of the van der Waals constants for chadium? Well, if it's an ideal gas, what equation would this follow instead of this one? Yeah, it would follow P, B equals N R T. So I ask you again, what would be the values of the van der Waals constants A and B for chadium? They'd be zero. Because if A is zero, this term goes away. If B is zero, this term goes away, and what are you left with? P V equals N R T. So the way a question could be worded on something involving the van der Waals equation is they might just give you a table. The table has like five different gases in it and list the A and B constant values for each of them, for the van der Waals constants. And then based on that table alone, it says, which of the following behaves the most like an ideal gas? Well, then what should you be looking for in the values of the constants to find that one? The smallest numbers possible. Find the smallest values for A and B possible. That's the one that behaves most like an ideal gas. OK, so that's the way one question could be worded. The other thing you probably want to know is what these things correct for. So the first term here, this corrects for the fact that molecules really do have attractive forces between each other. Ideal gas law, you know, the ideal gas assumptions say they don't. This is a real gas law, though. It says they do have attractive forces. This is trying to account for those. The second term, so minus NB here, this tries to account for the fact that the other ideal gas assumption is never 100% true, which means that gas molecules really have volume. I'll call that molecular volume in this case. So and there's our two corrections. We don't make any assumptions anymore. They have attractive forces, the molecules, and the molecules do take up volume. No assumptions made. Trying to approximate reality a little bit better than PV equals nRT. Cool. So know what each of these terms corrects for, and then know that the smaller the constant values, the more like an ideal gas that particular gas behaves.